um, Mukta, I'd, li I'd like to start by asking you a question. Um, um, in, in recent years, we've had some prominent women politicians. For example, in the United States, we've had three secretaries of state, foreign ministers, who are women. We had uh, Madeleine Albright under Bill Clinton, Condoleezza Rice under George W. Bush, and Hillary Clinton under Barack Obama. We've also had prominent female politicians in Pakistan. For example, uh, Benazir Bhutto was the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Are you disappointed by the lack of concern that these prominent female politicians and indeed male politicians have shown about the appalling treatment of women in Pakistan and indeed in other countries. जो मेरी समझ में आता है जो क्योंकि ज्यादा मेरा सियासत के साथ कोई ज्यादा ताल्लुक नहीं है जो खासकर मैं समझती हूं जो मेरी समझ में आता है औरत को खासकर पाकिस्तान की मैं बात करूंगी औरत को एक लीडरशिप तो दी जाती है उसको एक नाम की दी जाती है उसको اختیارات नहीं दिए जाते वेल आई एम नॉट आई हैव नो कनेक्शन एक्चुअली विद पॉलिटिक्स uh, what I believe and what I see in Pakistan, uh, there are women who are leaders, but actually they can't do much. And what about internationally? I mean, Pakistan is an ally of the United States and Britain and other Western countries. It gets a lot of financial aid from Western countries. Are you, do you think that Western politicians should put pressure connected to this aid to make sure that justice is done in cases such as yours so that the men, uh, uh, in case people don't know, were acquitted, five of the six people accused of the gang rape are free. Um, do you think that Western leaders should put pressure on Pakistani leaders to make sure that justice is done in cases like this? बिल्कुल कहना चाहिए क्योंकि जहां पर भी ना इंसाफी हो रही है किसी भी मुल्क में हो रही है क्योंकि दूसरे मुल्क का हक बनता है उसको रोकने की कोशिश कर यस यस एब्सोल्युटली द लीडर्स ऑफ इंटरनेशनल वर्ल्ड शुड प्रेशर पाकिस्तान और वेयर एवर दिस दिस इनजस्टिस इज हैपनिंग आई थिंक दे शुड प्रेशर दोस कंट्रीज सो वी कैन हैव जस्टिस um I'll make a question that maybe the others also would, or I'll ask Mukhtar one more question. Um, do, do you sometimes feel like giving up your public campaign because the pressure is too much, the threats, you now have two young children, um, there are many people in Pakistan who see you as a threat because you're speaking out against um, systems of uh, male dominance that they don't want to change. Now that you're a mother yourself, do you sometimes think that um, it's too much the risk to yourself and your family? Or do you think that it's your mission to continue your campaigns? 
کہتا ہے کہ کبھی کبھی کہ آپ کو فیل ہوتا ہے کہ آپ کو جو آپ اپنی مہم چلا رہے ہو وہ ختم کر دینی چاہیے کیونکہ آپ کے اوپر کوئی اور پریشر ہے آپ کو دھمکیاں دی جا رہی ہیں پاکستان ویسے بھی ایک مردوں کا معاشرہ ہے تو وہاں سے بھی آپ کو دھمکیاں ملتی ہیں کیونکہ آپ ان کے خلاف بولتے ہو تو آپ آپ کی اپنی فیملی ہے آپ کے بچے ہیں تو کیا آپ چاہتے ہو کہ کبھی کبھی کہ آپ اپنے لیے کچھ چھوڑ دیں جو بھی آپ مہم چلا رہے ہیں دیکھیں جب میں اپنے لیے سوچتی ہوں تو میں کہتی ہوں یہاں یہ چھوڑ دینا چاہیے لیکن نہیں جب میں ہزاروں لڑکیوں کے لیے سوچتی ہوں تو میں کہتی ہوں نہیں میں نے یہی رہنا ہے اور ان ان کے لیے کام کرنا ہے میں نے اپنے لیے نہیں کرنا ان کے لیے کرنا ہے ان کی جان کی حفاظت کرنی ہے اور جو کچھ مختار کے ساتھ ہویا ہے کسی اور مختار کے کوئی اور مختار نہ بنے like to quit uh, this campaign but when i see other girls uh, the, in, they are in thousands uh, i don't stop I, i don't give up i would like to work for them i don't want that there is another mukhtar what happened to me i don't want that other girls should also face that um, Well, I, I believe that uh, death and life is in God's hand. I, I got offer from Canada, from the United States, but I rejected and I stayed there. Very brave woman. Um, maybe I'll just ask if it's okay, the other two, because we have limited time on this panel. Um, in the past, when Western leaders have spoken out in moralistic terms, they've often been derided and pilloried. For example, Uh, Ronald Reagan described the Soviet Union as an evil empire. George W. Bush described Iran, Iraq, and North Korea as an axis of evil. There was much derision and criticism of those two leaders for these statements. Um, does it disappoint you that there is, isn't more of this kind of moral statements by political leaders. I mean, I know that from Soviet dissidents, when they heard that Ronald Reagan had called the uh, Soviet Union an evil empire, when it was the information was smuggled into them in prison, it gave them great hope. Is it a source of frustration that on the one hand, President Akhmenejad was invited on Larry King, for example, on CNN and given very soft questions, or he was invited to speak at Columbia University, very prestigious university in New York City. And yet, on the rare occasions Western leaders have spoken out in moral terms, a lot of people have almost laughed at them. I, do you have thoughts on this, either of you? Uh, sure. Um This is a complicated issue. I don't believe in the world in shades of black and white. So, you know, to say something is 100% evil and something is 100% good, I think that's quite naive. There are different shades of gray in the world. Some of them are darker than the rest. But um, to speak out against very specific acts that, uh, for example, of the government of Iran, you know, the massacre of political prisoners, the torture of political prisoners, the absolute disregard for women's rights in Iran, which are very specific. So what I would like to see from world leaders is to be very specific on what they are trying to condemn. Now, that is a good thing to do, but when I say this, I'm not asking the West or any country out there to go and bomb Iran. So these are very different situations, very different topics. And something that I'm asking on top of that, you know, to, to ask, let's say, uh, President Barack Obama to make a statement on condemning Iran for its disregard for human rights. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful thing to do. But what I think would go much further, as I said during my talk, is to actually give the stage to the actual victims of these crimes. Because let's say Larry King, what does he know? about what goes on in Iranian prisons. But if I'm sitting, well, of course, the President Ahmadinejad would never agree to do that. But if he had the courage, which he doesn't, and I'm inviting President Ahmadinejad right now to sit with me. CNN, are you in? Let's get President Ahmadinejad and me on the same stage, and we'll see what happens at the end. That is what I'm asking for. Of course, President Ahmadinejad doesn't have the courage, but guess what? I do.
you want to... Yes, I think that sometimes the moral statements can be uh, useful for raising uh, the level of uh, understanding, but you must challenge the leaders, but not crimin criminalize the people. And sometimes when you blame uh, the whole society, like saying Bukavu is a uh, world capital of rape, then you criminalize a, a whole group of, of, of human beings of a society, which is absolutely unfair. So that uh, it's better to me uh, to, to have practical to take practical measures to, uh, to change the mandate of the UN force, to give them a more active uh, mandate, to push for a better involvement of the international community than making uh, so uh, blunt uh, statements. Um, one question for Mukhtar, and then I'll also ask a question again for both of you. One question from the audience. Um, if people want to contact you, is there some website or a way of contacting you either from, for, to learn more about your work or to maybe make donations if people can. That was the first question from Mukhtar. And the second question from the audience is which people in Pakistani society are opposing your work for educating women and girls? politician uh, politician they have feudal background they oppose me the mostly they are sitting in assembly but their background is feudal their pa uh, their fathers brothers they are behind and they don't want that people get education so they can uh, free themselves from their slavery and yes she has website aapke paas website hai she is giving some contacts Okay, your colleague will bring up the website address, will she? Yes. Um, I just want to follow up with the other two, um, a more political question again. In a sense, we're here in Geneva where the UN Human Rights Council and other UN agencies are based. Is there something that's inherently problematic in the United Nations in that it gives equal weight to countries that are democracies and countries which are not democratic. For example, if a country wanted to join the European Union, before they could join, various criteria were put on East European countries, including human rights criteria and minority rights, before they were admitted to the UN, uh, sorry, to the EU. The UN seems to give equal weight to democracies and dictatorships, Often dictatorships collude together to stop more action on human rights. And of course, in the Security Council in New York, you have um, veto power to two countries which are not democratic, that's China and Russia. That isn't to say, of course, that Western countries don't also have human rights problems, but I think we can fairly say that they're different degrees of human rights abuse and it's significantly different between, for example, European countries and Iran. So maybe the entire structure of the UN needs to be changed or it should be possible to even expel a country. I don't know. Do you have any opinions? Well, uh, yes, that's a good question for sure. I'm not an expert on how the UN works, but just sitting there and watching the news, I think it would be very difficult to disagree with, I guess, an obvious fact that on many levels the UN has become extremely dysfunctional. Now, I guess that's also obvious that uh, it has a great deal to do with the veto rights and putting people, uh, well, countries, on a human rights council who, uh, you know, from countries that have terrible human rights records. That's uh, illogical and counterproductive. But what is the way to reform the UN and how can it be done effectively? 
uh, right now, I think there are so many people in this room that are more qualified um, to express opinions on that than I am. But uh, from where I'm standing, are there serious problems? Definitely, yes. Well, I, I believe in... I don't know about the, the reform of the Security Council, it is a very specific uh, item, but I, I strongly believe in fighting uh, impunity. So this is the link between uh, human rights, uh, international organizations, the pressure of the international opinion, and international justice. Because I know for my, out of my own experience that the fact that those warlords in, the, in Africa, when, once they know that one day, one day because those crimes are imprescriptible, any time they can be taken, even after 10 years they can be taken, bringing to a jail uh, somewhere and facing uh, the victims, facing a trial. Once they know that, that one day something with justice will, will hit them, that can, that can be, that can prevent them for, for uh, further crimes. So I really believe that the international justice could be a very useful tool, but it must not be politicized. It must be international justice for all of them, not for only, for, for one group and uh, the international community closing its eyes to us, other crimes. If it's impartial, I think it's a, it's a good tool for bringing peace and more uh, better un understanding for those uh, uh, potential criminals. Um, um, I'll just give Mukhtar's website out before I forget. It's uh, mukhtarmai.org. So that's M-U-K-H-T-A-R-M-A-I dot org. And there's an email at yahoo.com, which is muktarmai, and then M-W-W-O. That's the Muktarmai's Women's Organization, if anybody wants to be in touch. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? And this is one for Muktar again. Um, Are there other organizations similar to yours that are also trying to improve the welfare of women in the region? And if so, are you cooperating with them or maybe joining forces? Well, in my area, there is no such organization, but in cities, definitely, and we have some links with them as well. Um, another question from the audience for Marina. Um, do you have any specific advice for countries um, and ordinary citizens in pressuring uh, the government to improve the situation in Iran? Nowadays, in this age of technology and information, uh, it has become a whole lot easier to put pressure on governments. There are so many ways to do it. And I, in my own life, I have never looked up really to world leaders that much or to politicians to fix a situation because especially in democratic countries, democracy needs maintenance. You don't maintain democracy, it's going to die right in front of your eyes. Democracy is like water in the palm of your hand. If you take your eyes off it, even for a split second, it is going to drip through your fingers. So it is up to every single one of us who live in democratic countries, to pressure our, elect, uh, our elected uh, officials, to pressure our governments to do the right thing when it comes to either internal policy or external policy, to foreign affairs, to all of that. So I think every single one of us sitting in this room, we are responsible. And as I said, silence is not an option. Your silence you know, they say in every bullying situation, there are three parties. There is the bully, the bullied, and the bystander. 
If you are the bystander in a bullying situation, whether it is in the schoolyard, in an elementary school, or if it, if it is on the world stage, what difference does it make? If you are a bystander and you see an innocent human being being abused by another and you don't voice it. Now, whatever way you want, you want to do that. If you want to do it online or on Facebook or by creating a, an NGO or an organization, that's fine. But also actual presence is important. So I think whatever way you can find to get your voice heard, to attend events, to have rallies, to have protests, to basically to be seen by these world leaders who are doing horrific things to their population. Now, I don't know what your talents are. I'm using mine. So whatever your talents are, think about them and don't ever wait for your leaders, for President Obama, or in my case, you know, um, I live in Canada and we have Prime Minister Harper. Of course, I try to remain very active, but I also do it. I, I see myself as responsible. If there is blood being spilled, in Iran, I find it my responsibility to stand up and to voice my concern. I, I just might make one further comment before we have to wrap up the first session. Although, of course, we're living in a new age where um, through social networking and so on, individuals have much more empowerment than they did a few years ago, it seems to me as a journalist that the amount of foreign coverage of newspapers throughout the Western world is declining tremendously. There's so much trivia and fluff. And it, in the end, newspapers and TV networks are still a very good way of getting, through, getting stories across. And one might want to even write to your local newspaper or TV network to say you'd like to have more coverage of human rights issues and so on, because I know a lot of editors and so on think that audiences are not very interested in it, and that's why there's less and less. And you know, to, ha to, to encourage them to send brave journalists like Colette, and it obviously um, requires some financing to conflict zones and to interview the victims and so on, because I know that there's a trend in media that People are simply you know, more interested in shopping and reality TV shows and so on than these issues as though they don't exist. Anyway, that's just a final thought. Um, I'd like to thank very, very much all three panelists, remarkably brave, courageous, and articulate um, campaigners for human rights. Thank you.